Welcome to Antarctic Stories, a podcast that takes you behind the scenes into the rich world of people who live, work, and undertake daring expeditions in the polar regions. My name is Heather Thorkelson, and I'll be your host today. Stephen Eastow is an Australian contemporary artist from Melbourne, Australia. He is known for producing semi-abstract, mixed-media art, and his work is often informed by his experiences travelling. Eastow studied at the Victorian College of the Arts from 1979 to 1981. After completing his Bachelor's of Fine Art, he began to travel, first to New Zealand and Norway, and since then has not settled anywhere for more than a few months at a time. Since the early 1980s, he has participated in over 100 solo exhibitions and 100 group exhibitions in Australia and internationally. He is represented in many of Australia's state and national art collections, including the National Gallery of Australia, the National Gallery of Victoria, and Parliament House Canberra. In 2012, Eastow published Unstill Life, a book with a limited edition of 500 copies, documenting his 30 years of travelling, which he wrote over the winter of 2009 at Mawson Station in Antarctica. Eastow calls his art of travel an unstill life. He has made nine trips to Antarctica, three trips as the official Australian Antarctic Arts Fellow in 2000, 2002 to 2003, and 2009, and six times as an artist-in-residence on tourist ships. He travelled twice to the North Pole as part of a polar art residency on Russian icebreakers. In 2004, at Davis Station at the end of the summer, an Antarctic sculpture garden was instigated with the addition of three sculptures created on the outskirts of the station site. These little works joined an already standing wooden totem pole figure erected years ago by a tradesperson. Stephen's intention was to entice others to add to the garden, and this has since occurred. His 2006 summer studio at Australia's Davis Station in Antarctica was the subject of the ABC TV documentary Antarctic Art. On Eastow's third official trip to Antarctica, he overwintered at Mawson Station. In fact, he was the first Australian to overwinter in Antarctica as an artist since Frank Hurley. Just a side note that most of this bio is courtesy of Wikipedia. Stephen Eastow, welcome to Antarctic Stories. Hi there, Heather. How are you doing? I'm great, thank you. Now, I'm in Sweden today, but you are calling in from California, correct? That's right. Uh, Santa Monica, LA, where the, uh, where the smog is uh, fabulous. Excellent. And this is a temporary location for you as a wandering artist, I understand. Yes, I often do residencies in uh, weird and wonderful places, Antarctica being one of them, but uh, currently uh, LA for a few months. Yeah. Fantastic. So you have, you know, as we heard in your bio, you've been all over the world doing all kinds of interesting things as an artist. And today we're focusing a little bit more on your experience in the polar regions, which is quite unique, I would say. I've definitely met some artists in the polar regions, but not folks that have done quite what you have. So, and, you know, I think it's really interesting because a lot of artists perhaps don't realize that you could do the types of things that you do. Um, so I'm really excited to dive in and ask you a few questions about your experience, specifically in Antarctica. Your first fellowship in Antarctica was back in 2000. How did that come about? And was it something that you'd been thinking about for some time? Well, well, definitely, yeah. I I do call myself a you know a landscape artist, so I have this strong interest in topography and geography, and always had uh, some very exciting maps on my wall as a child. And sooner or later, I thought I would try to get to the southern continent. Of course, uh, it's a bit tricky to visit, but uh, I managed to. So I think it was 1987. Uh, the Australian Antarctic Division started a program taking down artists there and my old teacher B Maddock was one of the first uh, artists to go down with a mob of other artists so I knew about this program uh, for a while but I, I didn't actually apply uh, for, for the Australian Antarctic Arts Fellowship for quite a while 
uh, eventually I did, and uh, lucky me, I got, got down there uh, to uh, Casey Station. The first trip was actually uh, mostly a resupply, so it was a big chunk of uh, looking at the sexy Southern Ocean and a very short sort of peek at uh, Casey Station, which uh, got me uh, very excited and I wanted to go back again. Yeah, and especially being a landscape artist, of course. Do you know if the Australian Antarctic program is unique in offering an artist's fellowship down there? No, I, most of the English-speaking uh, nations and some of the other do is have some kind of program. The Americans do, uh, the British do, the Australians do, the New Zealanders do, South Africans, and I think that's uh, sort of a sloppily organised one. The Argentinians used to, that, is, that was aborted recently. So, so a handful of nations do offer some kind of trips for uh, artists to go down to the ice, yes. Mm, well, that's great news for any landscape artists that weren't aware prior that this is an option. <laughs> so yeah. when, when you went down to Antarctica the first time, was it as you expected? What, like, what were your first impressions as an artist looking at a landscape like that? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd spent a bit of time in some mountains before, so I wasn't uh, so sort of uh, surprised by the, the the ice or the cold. Or, but it's the scale that uh, is quite sort of shocking, and uh, everything is a little bit weird down there. You know, there's uh, <laughs> it's, it's, and 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 also I must say, you meet some fabulous people on these trips down there. Everyone's quite uh, intriguing, uh, whether they're a scientist or a doctor or a or even the chef that you meet down there, or, or, or marvellous sort of a bunch of characters. But to answer your question, no, it was, it was the scale was, which was pretty damn weird. It's a mm. big place. Yeah, I think as people who go down on tourist ships would probably agree, and certainly myself having been out, down as a guide, when people ask me, what is it that's so special about Antarctica? I always respond, it's just so big. <laughs> you just yeah. feel like the tiniest thing in the world when you're in a space like that. That's, that's right and uh, I, quite, I quite enjoy that. We get to the topic of you know the sublime and I, I think Antarctica is really fabulous at making you a very small speck of nothingness which is I think worthwhile for most humans to recognize that occasionally. Yeah, very true, very true. Now, normally on Antarctic bases, you know, every single person that's there costs the government money and they, they have a specific function that serves either a scientific purpose or is in support of the scientific endeavors or the scientific folks there, as a general yeah. rule, of course. As an artist, your position was entirely different. So can you tell us a little bit about a day in the life of an artist in Antarctica? Yeah, well... It well, that, that's not really true. I mean, they, they don't take artists down there to sort of dance around and make some uh, funny sort of penguin portraits. Most <laughs> programs uh, uh, utilise the skills of the artist to publicise scientific activity down on the ice. Oh. Scientists are traditionally pretty crap at sort of publicity and people like myself are, you know, a little bit better at it in terms of doing public things, writing books, going on radios, going on podcasts, having public exhibitions. So the role, the primary role of taking artists down there is to somehow advertise and remind the government to pump a lot of money down there so that scientists can do all of their research. Very interesting. So that was, in effect, my primary job down there. Huh. Me, me okay. Personally, I was personally there to make art. But that was the uh, role I played from the perspective of the Australian Antarctic Division. Right. But, 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 and, and to answer your other question uh, about, you know, the, the life of an artist down there, uh, it was pretty, pretty much a normal day for me, uh, just in a very strange location. I, I got up in the morning, had coffee and um, something to eat, and then off I went to the studio. It was quite normal. Right. Also, I... I did uh, operate as one of the team members. You have to do, share many of the chores down there, helping with resupply, helping with refueling, helping with cooking, doing the washing, rubbish sorting, fire drills, all of those things uh, I, I was involved in as, as part of the team. 
So, and as such, if you had to be involved in all of the fire drills and all that kind of thing, were you, did you go through training to be part, like to be a member of the base prior to going down to the base? Yes. On, on the first two times I did, I went through various sort of training programs, you know, how to drive a quad and a, a little bit of this and that, uh, but ba- basic training, yes. And then, of course, a lot you went through again when you got down on the uh, station. Right, yeah, with regular drills and things like that, I imagine. That's right, yeah. Okay, so and how was your role? I mean, given that it's a bit different yeah. than everyone else, how was your role perceived by the rest of the team there? Were they supportive? Yeah, that was, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, uh, yes and no. Um, I mean, on a couple of occasions, you know, I did meet the old-style Antarctic workers who were a bit dubious of the, you know, the wacky artists being down there, what the hell is doing down there, <laughs> cranking around. But once they saw me sort of working longer than they did and, not, and realised I wasn't being paid, um, they, they were a little bit surprised about uh, that. So uh, I, I kind of t- turned them on to my side in the end. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, because definitely, I mean, there are sort of career Antarctic folks that, as you say, might kind of look at you with a side eye wondering, what's this guy doing here? But <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose as with any remote location like that, when you're, as long as you're pulling your weight, usually yes. people come around. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, that, and that's what happened. You know, I, I'm pretty, pretty easy to get on with. So uh, that's quite important. Uh, a very strange little community like an Antarctic station. Yeah. How many people were at, I mean, you worked at a few different stations over the few times, the three times that you were down there. I would suppose the better question would be, what was the smallest population in a station you were working at versus the largest? Well, most Australian Antarctic stations are relatively small compared to McMurdo. Hmm. Summertime, 100 plus, and wintertime, maybe 12, 15. Wow. Quite a, it's, it's a quite a little mob of per- people. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, Stephen, you know, you're down there, you're in a really remote location. You obviously take your supplies with you. What would you say are the biggest challenges you face working as an artist in such a remote environment? Like, is it running out of supplies, not having the right supplies, or other things that someone like me might not even think of? Uh, well, luckily, because I went down there on one of the ships, so so I had there was there was no sort of problem with excess baggage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I took a lot of uh, art equipment down there, no, knowing in particular the last time I went for for eleven months or something. But that wasn't a problem, uh, you know, running out of white paint or what have you. It was more tricky, sort of the, the mental challenges are a bit more complex. You know, the, your body clock going with bananas and what's happening at home, a little bit of winter doldrums. Those are the more sort of uh, uh, tricky things. Uh, hmm. I'm, I'm a pretty organised man, so, you know, I, di- I didn't run out of white paint now. <laughs> yeah, it's more just the psychological elements of being, in a sense, out of your element. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. Very interesting. And it kind of... On that note, you know, because it's such a different environment, in what ways did that affect your creativity or your overall approach as an artist? Not, not a great deal, really. You know, making art anywhere is, is a, quite an oddball activity, you know, translating a sort of stimulus to, into visual art. It's complicated uh, anywhere. Yeah. It's a, it's a long, strange process, and, I, I, and I've been doing it for a bunch of decades. I'm quite used to it. So yeah, it, 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 I, my methodology didn't change so much. Uh, what I was busy painting uh, changed, of course. Uh, this time I was attacking uh, the topics like, uh, you know, the ice cap and aurora australis and moss beds. Uh, no, I, I, it didn't change a great deal of the way I made it. Uh, in many ways, it was a fantastic studio. You know, I didn't have yeah. to worry about going shopping. I didn't have to worry about it. Uh, you know, normal sort of things that people are busy with uh, because it was all there in this little tiny village uh, and I had a, and a, a nice little studio and I, I, I wasn't bothered by anyone. <laughs> That's, you know, it's such a good point that I wouldn't have thought of, but it's true. You're not thinking about having to go buy groceries or pay bills or do anything of the regular stuff of life. It's, you're just in the zone, essentially. 
That, that, that's right. So, uh, you know, lucky me. It's a fabulous, very rare treat for an artist to have such a, a long uh, stint of time uh, to, to be in that mode. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you went back, you've been back six times on expedition ships, which is a different beast, but specifically with the stations, there were three times that you went down, correct? And then the, the final time, which was in 2009, you actually overwintered at Mawson Station. Yes. What was it that prompted, well, I have two questions, actually. First of all, yeah. and I probably already know the answer, why did you keep going back? But the second question is, what prompted the overwintering? Well, I don't know, and, and Antarctica is... It's all about cold and ice, so it's all about winter. Even in the summertime, it's all about winter. So it was seemed pretty clear to me that I, I needed to sort of experience the winter. And also, also, summertime, as you know, is a really quite a busy time in Antarctica. All the science activity is going, uh, you know, full bore. Maintenance activity, transports full, buildings are full, repairs are going on, you know, expeditions are happening, tourists are running around visiting. So, so summer's a bit nuts uh, in, <laughs> in Antarctic terms. And, and in winter, things are a little bit more quiet. Uh, so yeah. that, that, uh, that was intriguing to sort of experience. Right. Yeah, I mean, to contemplate and, and assimilate uh, these range of pretty bloody weird experiences. Mm -hmm. The overwintering at Mawson, was that when you would have been with about half or I guess a dozen people or so that, at that time? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's a real skeleton crew in the dark. <laughs> yes, well, it was only dark for six weeks and that was because the Australian stations are on the coast, as are most. Right. It's only when you get into the guts, up into the ice cap, into the, the uh, interior, I mean, when you get to the much longer dark periods. Right, of course, yeah. So... If there's only about 12 people with you and you have this short little bit of darkness, what else was different about that experience in 2009, the overwintering, than the previous experiences in Antarctica? Well, you, you, you know, as I, as I mentioned, the, the uh, complications of, of a small village, this internal trip coping with the isolation and the village politics, it's like this oh, yeah. pressurised social behaviour like a pressure cooking. Imagine Big Brother times a hundred. You know, mm -hmm. No one can actually leave, and it's and it's a weird sort of artificial environment. There's no kids. There's no family. There's no babies. There's no old people. <laughs> you know, there's no. It's quite unusual. Mm -hmm. and, and if there's a little bit of a grating between one expeditioner and another, you know that can extrapolate. That can uh, blow up and affect everyone. So all, all, all that uh, is, is uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. usually, usually people are highly adaptable down there and, and they get on with it and they organise, but, you know, you, you never know. There's, there's some, sometimes some hiccups and some tricky things can happen which yeah. make a bad flavour through, throughout the station. My, my winter was great. I was lucky all, all the characters were, were, were marvellous and everyone got on. Although one person shut down for a little bit as in didn't come to dinner for a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's crazy. That, that, that was the communication guy. <laughs> <laughs> he got tired of communicating. <laughs> he still did his job. He, he, he was excellent. He still did his job, but he just didn't socialise with the rest of the uh, team for a couple of months. Yeah. But whether that was because of the team or whether some shit was happening at home, that, that's also the other uh, thing people don't realise. Okay, you can have some problems whilst being on the ice internally with this strange community, but you're stuck there. And what happens if your wife leaves you or, or someone, someone in your family dies and you're stuck there? So there's, there's these external things which you are connected to from a mm -hmm. fire, which can really uh, be quite uh, uh, damaging to you if, if something horrible happens elsewhere and you're not able to leave. Right. It's yeah. a, another kind of uh, complication of the isolation factor of winter. Absolutely. And, and that's something we've heard of from some of the other folks that we've interviewed on the program, just, you know, being stuck on a base or on a ship and finding out someone has passed away or is diagnosed with a terminal illness or, yeah. you know, I mean, my dog died when I was in Antarctica and I, oh. <laughs> I had to keep doing the song and dance in front of our guests on the ship as though nothing was wrong. And I was 
really obviously very, very, very sad. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange environment to be down there and not be able to just get on a plane and go deal with real life. You're, you're stuck with your own thoughts and your own mm. feelings of processing whatever it is that has happened in the other part of the world that you're not going to be able to access for some time. It's a, it's a real challenge. That's, that's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Well, on that note, and perhaps not so morbid, but what, what would you say is the weirdest thing that happened to you while you were down on the Great White Continent? Uh, no, no, nothing exceptionally weird. I mean, the whole, the whole thing of being there was a little bit weird in itself. But I, I, I guess a special thing was uh, in, the, in the middle of winter in June, we went to Taylor Rookery. Uh, it was it's, uh, off the, uh, near, the, near Mawson Station. Specifically to count some uh, emperor penguins mm -hmm. in this sort of colony that uh, was about it's about, it was about eighty or something kilometres from Mawson Station. So driving out there across the sea ice in, uh, in some harglands, and then um, finding the little penguin rookery and spending a few days out there counting these <laughs> these marvellous birds. That, that, that was quite a treat. But, uh, I, I I will not uh, forget that. Yeah, yeah, that's something very few people ever get to do. Well, 3,000 or I don't remember the number. I should remember. I was out there counting them. <laughs> <laughs> they excellent birds. I, I loved every one of them, the whole 3,000. <laughs> oh, that's great. Do you plan to go back and live on a base at any point or is that, has that ship sailed, so to speak? Ah uh, well, that's 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 uh, it's it's a nice idea in my mind. Uh, if I went back, uh, I don't know how I'd do that or with whom. I've, I've had my fair share of uh, adventures. Uh, I would like to go to somewhere where I have not been, but that's very uh, tricky. I mean, it's tricky getting in down to Antarctica in itself, but to go to some other places, with very remote ones. Uh, I don't know how I'll do that. I'd like to go to the dry valleys near Murdo. That would be excellent. I've never been there. Uh, yeah. Not sure how, how, how I would get there. <laughs> you have to impersonate a scientist, maybe. Yeah, oh, that, that, that's a cunning plan, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and oh. You said eccentricity in the beard, so I'm halfway there. There you go. There you go. Just wear some nerdy glasses or something. <laughs> that's but you've been up. You've also been up doing um, some stuff, some work in Greenland, and I understand you've been to the North Pole as well. So you're getting some serious polar region action in, by the sounds of it. Yeah, the, the, that was for about a decade. I seemed to be busy with the ice, but well, all the nineties. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, well, I'm sorry, not the nineties. The, the decade after, but yeah, but for about a decade, I seemed to be uh, running around in lots of polar spots. Uh, I have not done anything since 2009. Uh, in the chilly parts parts of planet Earth, maybe oh. I'll, maybe I will again in the future. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm trying to sort of stabilize. Well, you do have some really fantastic sort of collateral or media that you made while in Antarctica, and we're going to link to it in the show notes for sure. Uh, I watched a video in prep for this mm. podcast that was really interesting, and I think it gives a good insight into some of the experience you had, anyways, as an artist down in Antarctica. So anyone who is keen to see what that's like, they can click on the links in the show notes. Um, but yeah. what advice would you have for an artist that's keen to go down? What, what would you say in terms of just preparing oneself for that type of, of residency? Um, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, to, to be highly adaptable is, is probably very smart. And mm -hmm. uh, it, <laughs> to, to, to take lots of equipment. I, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's different for everyone. I, I not sure uh, what, what, uh, what else I would suggest, but uh, one must. There's lots of sort of hurry up and wait kind of thing. You know, patience, mm. you know, empathy, uh, receptiveness. Yeah, uh, all the good people skills. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, all, all are necessary down there. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today, Stephen. It's been really interesting to get a little insight into your world. Is there any project or cause that you want to give a shout out to, like a current project you're working on or something you'd like to direct our listeners to, to check out? No, no not really. I'd, I'd, I'd be happy if they wanted to see uh, what I do uh, in, in terms of making visual art. I uh, can be seen on my website and, and those little sort of uh, videos you mentioned before. 
but really I, I just hope everyone is very nice to planet earth and uh, nice to each other and not so greedy <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the good things people should be good the good things absolutely well that's a great note to end it on thank you again Stephen, for your time and we hope to have you back sometime on antarctic stories very good thank you heather We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Antarctic Stories. If you like the stories we bring to you, please subscribe for future episodes. And if you want to help the podcast, leaving a rating or review greatly assists us in reaching a wider audience. Antarctic Stories is a production of Twin Tracks Expeditions, your experts in small ship expedition cruises to the Arctic and Antarctica. We love sharing our insider knowledge to help you find the perfect ship for your next polar expedition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or at TwinTracksExpeditions.com.